I have felt this subject on my heart from the Lord, and so I'm going to do a standalone message today on the subject of joy. Okay, and I'm going to ask you this question, what is real joy? What is joy from the Lord? Because the Bible tells us that this joy in our life, the enemy can't take it away from you. Like, it doesn't matter your circumstances. It doesn't matter what your life looks like right now. It doesn't matter if it's a good day or a bad day. This is a joy the devil cannot take away from you. But I also realize it's a joy we're not experiencing. Let's be honest. As many believers today, we know that this is true, but at the same time, we sound just like everybody else. Oh, this day. Uh, I can't stand this day, or I can't stand this person and what they said about me, and we're complaining and we're griping when God says, listen, I will put my joy in you. Listen to the words of Jesus, because this statement is so powerful, it should change your life. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. Okay, and Jesus is talking to his disciples. Here's what he says, John 15, verses one through five. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Now he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While each branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will produce even more fruit or be more fruitful. And you are already clean, Jesus is saying, because of the words that I have spoken over you. Jesus has washed them by his words, by his grace. But listen to this. Jesus also said, remain in me and I will remain in you for no branch can bear fruit by itself. So it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now listen to this. He said, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. So I, I get that this is a little wordy, okay? But it's powerful too. What Jesus is saying, he's making it very clear that a branch cannot survive if it's not connected to the vine. And if that branch is not connected to the vine, what's going to happen to that branch? It's going to wither away. It's not going to produce fruit and it's going to die. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, listen, if you're not connected to me, the vine, you will produce no fruit in your life. In fact, you will spiritually die. You will spiritually see death in your life because you will not be able to overcome the trials that try to attack you. Because the Bible also tells us that the enemy is always watching, always coming after us. His demons are always shooting these fiery arrows at us, trying to attack us. But when we have Jesus on our side, Jesus is like, nope, nope, this won't touch you. That won't touch you. Nothing will hurt you. And it's this joy, it's this confidence by remaining in the presence of Jesus and knowing what he's doing for you. But apart from Jesus, you hear me? You can do nothing. You can do nothing. What does that life look like? For a lot of us, it's very relatable. It looks like anxiety. You're constantly feeling anxiety over your situations because you're feeling like everything is out of your control. And so when you walk into the room, everybody knows it right? Because it's all over you. Like other people feel it. You're worried constantly about what's going to happen and you're full of doubt. And so what does that produce in your life? A lot of stress. And life is so busy. A lot of us are just trying to keep up with everybody else, trying to get things accomplished. Have you ever been so tired, so busy, looked at your life and said, what have I gotten done? I'm constantly moving, I'm constantly going, I'm trying to get this done, yet nothing I do is satisfying. Nothing I do is really bringing me a fulfillment that I'm trying to accomplish in my life. And then how do you feel? Frustrated, angry, and fearful. Why? Because without Jesus being the vine in your life, being connected to Christ, there is no peace in your life. Let me say it like this. Only Jesus can bring you peace because only Jesus is the source of all of our hope. Only Jesus, by putting all of your hope and trust in Jesus, I know, hey, this situation, it stinks. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to tell you the truth. It's hard. But I know that Jesus can turn it all around in the end. Listen to this. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has great mercy, and because of his mercy, he gave us a brand new life. What does this new life bring us? This new life brings us a living hope. Underline living hope. In fact, tell somebody next to you, I got a living hope. I'm going to explain what that means in a second, okay? 
But it says it brings us a living hope through Jesus Christ because of his resurrection from the death. Why does Peter say it's a living hope? Because it will never die. Whew. It is a hope not based upon your circumstances. It is a hope in Jesus not based upon if you're in a good mood or a bad mood. It is a hope that will never die, can never be crushed or taken away. It will never end. Think about that. I really take that in. Like, this is a hope for you that God wants to give you. A joy. And it never goes away. You are completely content in the joy that God wants to give you. And here is the most powerful statement that I love that Jesus said. And he said this in John 15, verse 11. Now, he's still talking to his disciples. But he said, listen, I have told you all this, that I am the vine, and you can do nothing without me because that way my joy can be in you and that your joy may be complete. Yes, listen to this, your joy will overflow. Now, notice how Jesus said this though. He said, listen, I need to put my joy in you. You realize that? Jesus said, I must put my joy in you, so therefore you must be connected with me because my joy will make your joy complete. And guess what happens? Then it overflows and you changed. And people notice it. You're no longer griping, you're praising God. And people look at you weird, like, why is he so weird now? <laughs> because you're not grumpy like everybody else? Because you're not miserable like everybody else? Because even though your circumstances haven't changed, your heart has? And the world's never gonna understand that. They don't see that yet. They don't understand true joy. But the thing is, the world is constantly trying to find it and they can't. And here you are with a joy that is supposed to overflow because of your relationship with Christ. But I realize many of us don't experience this today. Why? Because we have confused joy from the Lord with worldly happiness. Let me ask you this question. Right now, what is the one thing that would make you so happy? Think about it. If you could write it down, what is that one thing you've been wanting for a long time? Like, God, like, I love you. But if you could bring this in my life, that'd be great, right? It'd make you so happy. Maybe it's a brand new dream home. And I'm talking about like this dream home has that remodeled bathroom and it has one of those showers that's like a rainforest. Like no matter what you went through today, it sings to you and you're like, this is the greatest thing on earth, right? Maybe that would make you happy. Or maybe it's a brand new car and it can drive itself and you'll never have to parallel park again, right? Or maybe it's just a relationship. Like you are sick and tired of seeing everybody else's cute pictures on Facebook of their relationships. Listen, God, I can be cute too. Can I take some pictures with somebody as well? We're pursuing these things. And we think it's going to bring us this happiness, but what happens when it doesn't? What happens when you get everything that you wanted and you realize it still doesn't fulfill you and it's not what you thought it would be? Because I understand, listen, the world will tell you that more is happiness, right? That is a dangerous concept, a very dangerous concept. Let me show you why. First John chapter two, verses 15 through 17 says it like this. Do not love this world, nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the father in you. Now, reading this for the first time, you may be saying, but that's kind of harsh. Like there's some good things in this world. Yes. Every good thing in this world comes from above, right? Every blessing in your life comes from above. What the scripture is saying is that you start pursuing happiness of the world instead of pursuing a relationship with God. Then everything gets out of whack. Then everything gets out of order and you're no longer happy. Why? Because you just crave so much. Listen to the wording here. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see. I want it. I want that. I need that in my life. Then it would make me happy. And pride in our achievements and our possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. Pay close attention to the wording here because he says only the world can offer you a craving. Why just a craving? Because you'll never be full. You realize that? You will never be full. You will continue to be hungry. You will continue to search for more, but you will never, ever be satisfied. That's what he's saying right here. Pay attention, okay? And here's a revelation of why you won't be happy as well, because this world is fading away. Along with everything that people crave, 
but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. What does this mean? This, this means that that new car you want, it will get old. You'll no longer want it. You'll want something else. That dream home that you loved will start to fall apart eventually. Things will happen. You'll want something else because there's a new news somewhere, you know? And if you're not careful in your relationships, in your marriage, it could be so easy to say, you know what? I'm just not happy. If I had a new marriage, I'd be happier than this. And I've seen over and over and over again, people run from their relationships, run from their marriage to chase a chase just to find out in the end it didn't satisfy still. But now they broke up their family and they, they had this hurt in their life and they made these decisions that they're not proud of. And now they may be screaming to God, God, can I ever be happy again because I've messed up so much in my life? And maybe that's you in different ways. Maybe you've messed up so many things in your life because you keep running away from God, because you keep chasing something and you don't even know what it is. You have no clue what you're chasing after, but you're not chasing after God. And you're frustrated and angry and tired because guess what? This chase after something more will never satisfy and eventually you'll get tired. You'll get very tired. Listen, here's what the devil doesn't want you to know. Listen to this. I'm talking about joy, okay? Joy is a spiritual need, not a physical one. That's why people can't find it in this world. That's what makes it different from happiness because happiness is defined off of your circumstances. I'm happy right now because, hey, I got $100. Or I'm happy right now because I love to eat and today is a cheat day for me, so I'm gonna eat, okay? Or I'm happy right now because this circumstance is, is good for me. But what happens when the circumstances aren't good? Are you happy? No. And the Bible warns us, listen, you're gonna go through some hurt feelings. People are gonna betray you. Things are gonna happen in your life. That's okay. God will heal you through it. But you're not always gonna be happy. But the word of God does promise joy this joy inside of you that, again, the enemy cannot take away. But joy is a spiritual need, not a physical one. Listen to this. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love. Let's say this one, this next one together. Ready? Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Who produces this joy in you? Your money, your position, your spouse. Again, these things can be blessings, but they still do not fulfill you like the spirit of God living inside of you. This is where your true joy comes from. Listen to this, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. I pray that God, the source of our hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace. Don't miss this. Because you trust in him. You have joy from the spirit of God because of what? Because you trust what God is doing. I don't understand. This hurts. But God, I still trust you. And then look at the next line. Then you will overflow with confident hope. Because I know my God is able through the power of the Holy Spirit, meaning you are never alone. How many times? <laughs> I feel like we cry out to God all the time. God, I'm just so tired of being lonely. I'm tired of being alone. I'm tired of like, people not getting me and all these things. And God is saying, I get you. I hear you. But yet you don't hear me. Every time you're distracted with everything else. You're not hearing my voice. I'm inside of you. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God living inside of you wants to give you this joy, but you have to be connected to Christ in the presence of God for that fruit to produce in your life. You understand, this is, this is powerful stuff. This is life-changing statements from Jesus about a joy that you can never, ever lose. It is overflowing, okay? So that's a lot, but here's my title of today's message. The title of today's message is this, how to have joy, all right? How to actually have joy in your life to receive it from God 
and to live it out daily, okay? And here's what I wanna do first. So I wanna give you some background in the days of Jesus because this is important. In the days of Jesus, there were actually four different types of Jewish religious groups that challenged Jesus on the meaning of life. In fact, they not only challenged Jesus, they challenged each other. That's why there were four different groups. They couldn't agree on the meaning of life. And these four different groups were the Essenes, the Zealots, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, okay? And they all, they all had their own idea of what happiness is, what way you should be living to please God. And here's what's really scary because I started to study their methods and their teachings and everything. And I realized, man, a lot of us today are believing the same lies that they taught. A lot of us today are searching for these things that will not really bring joy into our life. So for the next three points that I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna show you what joy is not, okay? But also what joy is from the Lord. So point number one is this. Joy is not running away from your problems. Can I say that louder? Listen, joy is not running away from your problems. To be joyful doesn't mean I don't like you. I don't like that place. I don't like what's going on over there. I'm going to run away from everything because again, that is a race that's going to get you very, very tired. And eventually all your problems just catch up and guess what? They explode in your face, okay? They get worse, all right? But joy does not mean running away from your problems, but the Essenes, this religious group, believed, here's their philosophy, in order to be happy, they believed you need to seclude yourself, okay? In other words, their vision statement would sound like this, we don't like people. <laughs> Pretty much is what they taught. We don't like people, so if you get away from people, you get away from problems. You're not dealing with people, you're not dealing with, with problems. And I realize in scripture, there, you don't really see much about them because we know more about this group due to uh, Flavius Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, and he wrote about them, and they would hide in caves, right? And they would just copy the text, the word of God. That's all they did because they did not like people. This is an introvert's paradise, okay? I have to admit, I am an introvert at heart. This didn't sound too bad to me. Okay, run away from people, that's fine. But listen, it's a lie. Running away from people, running away from your problems, it's a lie. You can't escape these things because even when you sleep, you'll think about it. They'll bring you nightmares and you'll feel this weight on your shoulders. You cannot escape it. Okay, you're going to have to give it over to the Lord. But listen to this. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 30 and 32. Now, this is the message translation, but I like how it's worded. It says, don't run from trouble, but instead take it full face. For the worst, listen to this, it's never really the worst. Why? Because the master won't ever walk out and fail to return. Meaning that when life gets hard, God is not going to leave you. The worst is still not the worst. It could always be worse than that, and then it could be worse than that, then it could be worse than that. And listen, through it all, God is saying, listen, I'm here. I'll heal you. I'll take you through this. But in the end, every trial that you faced, everything that you went through will be worth it if you followed in obedience to the Lord. But you only see that on the other side right? So here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, don't be afraid of your feelings. Don't be afraid of your problems. In fact, face them head on, meaning feel them. Don't fear them. Pretty much feel your feelings, but do not fear them. And this is how you have joy, no matter the situation. Listen to James chapter one, verses two through four. And he said it like this, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, run, hide, Punch them in the face and just keep going. No, <laughs> we would like to, but that's not what he said. He said, consider it an opportunity for great joy. And I'm, I'm telling you, the Bible rewires the way we think, the human nature at its core. Because we don't think this way. God, I'm going through trials and I'm supposed to have joy through this? Why? He said, consider it an opportunity for great joy because when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. What does that mean? What does that look like? God, I don't like what they said about me. God, I don't like how they hurt me. Or I don't like what they did. But I still trust in what you're doing. And as you walk in obedience, what do you see? I'm, I'm telling you, you will always, always see the love of God and a miracle of God. 
What does that do to your faith? It matures you because God shows up. And now, no matter what situation you go through, you already had the confidence and the hope in God because you know he will show up again. He will do it over and over and over again. And again, people will look at you like, how come you don't face doubt? Oh, I see doubt. I hear doubt. I don't believe doubt because Jesus told that doubt to move out of the way. There's somewhere I got to be. There's something that I have to do. What if we lived this way as believers? How would your life look completely different? But again, you can't run away from your problems. Listen to this revelation, though. Here's why you can't. If you always run from your problems, you'll never allow God to take down what you're running from, which means you'll never receive rest. You will always be tired, always frustrated and upset. And there's just one illustration of Jesus facing his emotions. I want to show you this this story has always blown me away. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 14. It will be on the screen as well. But Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, uh, let me give you some background here. King Herod just beheaded John the Baptist. John the Baptist is Jesus's cousin. He's his family member. He loves him. He is his friend. And now Jesus finds out this information that John the Baptist has been beheaded, and so he's mourning. But what a lot of people don't understand, too, is King Herod kind of went crazy because he was afraid of John the Baptist. He didn't want to behead him, but he made a deal that he couldn't resist. And so he, he did that, and he started to get inside of his head, and he started to hear about Jesus. And when he heard about Jesus, John the Baptist, uh, uh, King Herod started to think that Jesus might have been John the Baptist resurrected. Okay, so that's what he started to believe in his mind. So now Jesus knows, not only is my family member, he's been murdered, okay, but now he knows that they're coming after him. He knows that death is knocking at his door. His time is coming very near. Imagine these emotions. Somebody you love was murdered, and now they're coming after you. How would you feel? Okay, think about it like that. So what does he do? He gets in this boat, and he goes off by himself to be with the Father, to hand these emotions over to the Father. Then something happens, and this is what blows me away, the way Jesus responded, okay? Matthew chapter 14, 13 and 14. When Jesus heard about John, he left there privately in a boat and went to a secluded place. But when the crowds, the crowds heard about this, they followed him on foot from the cities. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt, listen to this, he felt compassion for them. And he helped heal their sick. Why does this amaze me? Because Jesus was mourning, he was hurt, his life was being threatened. And most of us, you know what we would have done? Now is not a good time. I don't want to talk to you right now. Listen, can I just have some alone time? I don't want to be with y'all right now. I don't want to deal with it. Y'all have so many problems, I just don't want to hear anymore. Let me be. That's how we would react. And to be honest, it's understandable. But when I look at Jesus and this demonstration here, what did he do? He gave his feelings over to the Father. And because those feelings are healed, he felt compassion for the people. God always feels compassion. Through the Old Testament, through the New, he has always had compassion. Every time you repent, every time you search for him, every time you seek him, God will always be near. He will never tell you, go away. Now is not a good time. But Jesus shows us this powerful example of what it's like to go through some of the hardest of trials yet still have a joy because he could have just been soaking or become bitter like many of us would do. But instead, he offered healing. He offered healing. And, and here's what I realized. We can have joy through our problems because of Jesus, because in the end, there will always be healing. <laughs> and that's why I say this can hurt right now, but I know what my God can do in the end. There's healing. So joy doesn't mean running away from your problems like the Essenes taught. Point number two is this. Joy does not come from pleasure. Joy does not come from the pleasures of the world. The next two religious groups I want to talk about are the Zealots and the Sadducees, okay? And the Zealots believed that it's power and status that makes you happy. 
Pretty much the zealots thought that if they overtake the Roman government and having that status and that power and that authority, then everything will be better. Everything would be good. They would have it, right? They would be able to rule the land. But then the Sadducees believed something different. The Sadducees believed in no resurrection. I'm going to tell my corny joke here. This is why they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. Okay. I just have to say that every time I say their name. But they didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in any of that. So guess what they were saying? Hey, live life however you want to. Enjoy life. Because there's no afterlife, you're going nowhere, and there's no punishment afterwards. Who does that sound like? Exactly what the world tells us today. Power, status, live life in the moment. You know you shouldn't be there around those people. But man, isn't it fun? That's how the enemy entices you every time. Come over here. Or you know you shouldn't be talking to this person. But isn't it fun in the moment? And you're having all these feelings. Listen, feelings can be liars. The Bible tells us that the heart is the most deceitful thing. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things. It is extremely sick. Who can understand it fully and who knows its secret motives? But the Sadducees did not believe that anything would happen to you. Acts chapter 23, verse 8. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. They believed in no angels and no spirit. And we allow the same lies to get inside of our head. Listen, if that was true, let me make this point. Why was King Solomon so miserable? If that was true, if it's power and status and wealth and money and all these things, why was King Solomon uh, so miserable that he wrote one of the most depressing books out of the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes? Yet he had everything at his fingertips, so much that I don't think we even fathom. Let me share some facts about King Solomon, okay? Um, King Solomon would not think your silverware would do. No matter how fancy it is. Why? Because none of his utensils or cups were silver. Everything was pure gold. Listen to this. First Kings chapter 10, verse 21. All of King Solomon's drinking cups were solid gold and all of his utensils in the palace of the forest of Lebanon, they were not made of silver for silver was considered worthless in Solomon's day. And I did this research and I thought this was mind blowing, but according to today's housing market, Solomon's house would be worth $4 billion. Imagine being in real estate on that one. Like, who can I be your realtor, please? Thank you, Lord. $4 billion. And I searched that there's only one place today that costs more than that, and that's Buckingham Palace. That is it. Everything else is under this. Not only that, but listen, he had a net worth of $2 trillion. Two trillion. Let me put this in perspective. Elon Musk today has a net worth of about 271 billion. Okay, so two trillion is Solomon. He drinks with golden cups. His house is beautiful, more than anything you've ever seen, right? He has all the money in the world. Guess what? He has more than that too. He has all the servants you need, which means that his house is always in order. There's no dirty laundry on the floor. There's nothing that needs to be cleaned or swept. There's nobody uh, making a mess because everything was clean. And for a lot of us, that is happiness, right? Everything to be in order. Somebody else taking care of it. Not only that, but he had plenty of women, okay? He had a lot of women in his life. First Kings chapter 11, verse 3 says he actually had 700 wives. Good Lord. Okay, 700 wives, but listen to this, of royal birth. So 700 wives that came from royalty and 300 concubines. I've said this joke before, but he really is the original Mr. Steal Your Girl. Okay, don't come near him because he will take your girl. All right. And ladies, also, this meant that unlimited name is on Prime every day. He had everything, right? And listen to this. He was also intelligent. First Kings 430. In fact, his wisdom exceeded all the wise men of the East and all the wise men of Egypt. So he was smart, he was powerful, he was rich, and we also know that he was handsome because King David was extremely handsome according to the word of God, and Bathsheba was so beautiful that her beauty caused David to fall in sin. So he literally had everything that we think would make our life perfect. He had power and status and money and women and all these things that the world says, hey, that would make you happy. That's what the zealots said, power and status. The Sadducees said, live however you want to. And Solomon comes up and says, I am miserable. I am so miserable. Yet he had so much. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2, everything he said is meaningless. 
says the teacher, completely meaningless. This is why so many of us today are so confused. We're searching for something besides God to bring us happiness, and it never will. Because let me show you the revelation here. Why did this happen to King Solomon? Let's look back at 1 Kings 11, verse 3. Now, he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, but listen to this. In fact, they turned his heart away from the Lord. He started to worship other idols, pagan gods. He built altars to these pagan gods. He turned his heart away from the source of all hope. And even though he had everything, he was living in misery. Does that sound familiar? Maybe where you've been, maybe where you are right now, maybe there's some of the things that you've struggled with. And I realize as a Christian, right, we say, well, yeah, I came to Jesus. Shouldn't I just automatically be happy? <laughs> Shouldn't I just be happy with everything in my life, right? But listen, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, what did it say? But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, joy and peace and love and kindness. Listen, you know what that means? For the Holy Spirit to give you this fruit, this means that you need to be in the presence of God consuming the fruit. Because what you consume in your heart matters. What you're allowing into your life truly matters. And God wants to give you the good fruit, the healthy stuff, the stuff that makes you complete. God, I got your joy today because I spent time in your presence. Because I'm connected to the vine. I'm connected to Jesus. And I have trust, even though life may not be perfect. And sadly, a lot of us start out that way. But then we get a little distracted. We get a little busy. We were good with the blessings, so now I'm comfortable. Comfort's a big temptation. And we see ourselves on this side, and the devil tempts us too. Now, this is a sordid fruit. At least that's what it says on the package, right? Is this as good as for you as that is over there? No, but I guarantee if I brought both of these home and told my kids, which one do you want? This is going to be the one that they pick right? Because it's satisfying to the taste. These are gummies. These are good. I want this. This is sugar. More, more, more. And we're allowing this imitation counterfeit type of happiness in our life. It's counterfeit. It's not the real thing. But what you consume daily matters. And a lot of us find us ourselves at this place because we consume so much of the world and the fake things, and then we're looking at the sky saying, God, how come I'm not happy? Because look how far away you are. God has been calling your name over and over and over again, yet you're so distracted by this, and it's not satisfying, and it's hurting you, and you feel it. And you can enjoy peace today if you humble yourself. And say, God, I miss them. I ran from you. I chased the world. I found a lot, but it wasn't enough. And the Bible calls that a curse. You want to know why? Because it is a curse to keep chasing after something and never finding it. It is a curse to always be hungry, yet never full. <laughs> a curse to be thirsty, but never have a drink that satisfies. And Jesus said, listen, what I give you will satisfy you. You will never thirst again. But joy is not automatic. It's consumed daily by the Spirit of God, by being connected to the vine. Do you understand? And this gets you through the trials of life. And this changes who you are. And I get it. A lot of us say, God, I just, why can't I just have everything I want and be content? <laughs> because again, everything, everything but God is the opposite of joy. It's a curse. So let me share with you my, my last point here. Point number three. Here's how joy enters your life. True joy. Joy comes from being poor in the spirit first. Poor in the spirit first. It was the Pharisees that we see over and over again that challenged Jesus. They always came out and they're the ones that condemned them. And what did they believe? They believed in religious traditions will save you. 
religious uh, customs of man-made rules, they will save you. But they themselves didn't even follow the law of Moses perfectly because nobody can. Only Jesus can do that. So here's what they were doing. They were pretending to be perfect on the outside. They were putting on a mask. And you know what Jesus called them? He said, listen, you hypocrites. Matthew chapter 23, verse 13, he said, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you pretend to be perfect on the outside, but on the inside, you are miserable. And one of the famous sermons, one of the most famous sermons that Jesus ever preached is the Sermon of the Mount. Okay, listen to what he taught about joy. Because he, talk, he starts to talk about the Beatitudes. What are the Beatitudes? It's your attitude in every, any situation. And he started to say, blessed are you, blessed are you, poor in the spirit. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Blessed are you when things don't go your way. Blessed are you. Listen, in the Greek, you know what that means? Happy. <laughs> so let me say it like this. Happy are you when you're persecuted. Happy are you when others talk about your name because you follow Jesus. Happy are you those that are poor in the spirit. But I believe that Jesus intentionally made this first statement in Matthew 25, verse two and three. Here's what he said. Jesus opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what a lot of people don't know is exactly who Jesus was talking about. He wasn't just talking about the poor that's, that's trying to work but not getting enough money. No, he's talking about those that were disabled since birth, that were ashamed of who they were. They were ashamed of how they looked. They were ashamed of what was going on in their life and they hid in the dark. But listen, they would have to beg for mercy from people because otherwise they would die. And Jesus starts off like that. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are crying out for mercy. And if it's not received, you will die. Why did he do this? Listen, shocking truth from Revelation chapter three, verse six. This is a, uh, verse 16. This is a very popular verse about God spitting out the lukewarm church. And a lot of people know about it, but they don't know why. So let me show you. Revelation three, 15 and 16 says, I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold, and I wish you were one or the other. But since you are lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And that's usually where we stop. Let's keep reading. Why were they lukewarm? Because you say I'm rich. Because you say you have everything that you want. And you don't need a thing from God. And you don't realize, listen to the wording here, you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You have everything you want. You are so rich. You have all the possessions. You have the status and the power. But because you believe you don't need God, you are miserable on the inside because you were created to worship the one true God. You were created to know him, to know his love above all other things. And so nothing in this world can satisfy. Do not allow the creation to become your God. The creator gives you blessings, but he also allows trials in your life. For me, some of the most frustrating times were the feelings that I had to go through so that it would motivate me for change, to have faith. One of the hardest things that I've happened during the days of evangelism and I've shared many blessings and miracles and this was a surprise blessing but we knew even though God was taking care of our family to pursue evangelism we needed to sell our house it was our first house and I remember being tormented by my own thoughts as a father because I was scared I knew God was telling us to do this. I was, I was scared and now I'm giving up my home. Like this is my home. And it, it could have been so easy to be upset. And I remember having to put, we just had Mike at the time, all of his stuff in a storage room. And I said to myself, I'm, I'm never gonna do this again. Like I'm never gonna do that again. I never wanna see my child's stuff in a storage room because of this. And I didn't understand. And, it was so easy to be angry. Like, God, you told me to do this. 
Why do I have to give this up? Hey, this was my security. This was our home. And God just whispered, because what I have for you is better in the end. And I saw the vision of this church. I didn't know that then. But I saw the vision of this church. I saw the vision of the ministry. My wife did too. And, and I remember us getting together and, you know, there was a lot of stress at that time. And me and my wife could have been arguing and fighting and all these things. But instead, I remember the most us laughing and joking around, <laughs> saying that when we sell this house, we're going to be praising God and praying over these people and, and witnessing to them and, and God's going to do something. I wasn't happy about it, but I had joy. And then immediately I get a call and God ended that time of evangelism. I went to work at a church again for a while and God opened up those doors all on his own. I just followed him. And here's when I realized it's such, that time was so hard, but it was one of the biggest blessings because there were no strings attached when God told us to move to North Carolina on faith. And as soon as we came here, in just a little bit of time, settling in Hickory, God showed us his house. And I won't forget the scripture that was on the house because it's on the windowsill. But it's Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And that joy got us through everything. And that joy is still getting us through everything today and the trials that are coming ahead of us, for I know there will be many as this church continues to grow and continues to impact. But what I found out is in the end, what God has for you is always better than what you had before. It's always better. This is the joy that overflows inside of your heart. This is the joy that Jesus is telling you, you can receive it today. Get rid of your doubt and understanding of the world and trust God in what he's doing. Come into his holy presence and allow his peace to overtake your heart so that you can finally feel relief. Aren't you tired from running from your problems? Pursuing counterfeit pleasure. Having everything, yet having nothing that truly matters. God wants to change that today. Can I have you stand up right here? I'm asking our prayer team to come up front. Everybody just close your eyes. Hear my question, don't get distracted. Do you know this joy? I really, do you, do you know this joy from the Lord? Do you know what you can receive today? Do you know what he wants to give you right now? And all you have to do is you can come to the altar. You can have somebody pray over you. You can pray to God at your chair. You can pray over somebody that's next to you that you know needs God right now. But be honest with yourself. Are you struggling in this area? You feel like you don't have the joy that God is offering. You feel like you've allowed so many things to get in the way of your relationship with God and you're tired of running because you're worn out and the problems just keep piling up with nobody looking. Will you raise your hand right now if that's you? I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Today, I'm telling you, you can experience the joy of God and it will never run dry. It will continue to overflow in your life in your heart. It will change who you are. It will change your heart. It will change your mind. It is a joy that this world cannot understand. It is a joy that comes straight from heaven. That is a gift if you choose to receive it. Right now, if you need to come up front, come up to the front. We got people that want to pray over you specifically. But I also want to pray over you. And I pray, God, Restore our joy. 
grab our hearts and bring us back to you. God, I'm, I'm sorry, and we're sorry, Father, for the times that we've been so distracted by everything else, and we didn't see you. The times that we declared disaster over our own life because we're frustrated and angry. And every day we wake up, it's a battle, Father, over our mind because everything we look at just wants to ruin our hope, bring us stress, make us feel like everybody's divided and against each other. But because of you, Jesus, we will come together. Unite us as, brother, united as brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter where we come from, no matter what's happened in our life. For Father, we praise you and there's healing on this other side of every trial that comes because of your compassion. That's where our joy comes from. Because of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, that's what we should consume daily. And so I pray right now, and maybe you wanna lift your hands up to the sky. Maybe you wanna come down to the altar, but right now, will you just pray, God, I receive your joy. I receive your joy, I'm tired of running away. And I receive your goodness and I receive your love. And I wanna know more, Father. I wanna truly know you in an intimate way that changes me. Right now, God, I pray in Jesus' name, let them feel you, let them know you. Let your word come to life. Let your promises come to life right now, Jesus. I thank you, God. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing. I thank you, Lord. And if you've never accepted Christ into your heart right now, I want you to pray this prayer. We're going to pray it together. And do not just leave. Get with a volunteer. After we do the baby dedication, get with a volunteer. We would love to pray over you and, and see you grow in Christ. Or even if you need a volunteer right away, come get a volunteer. We're ready to pray over you now. But let us pray together. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave. Forgive me of my sins and lead me by your Holy Spirit in complete joy. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, it's Pastor Bobby Chandler and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So we love our Authentic family and thank you today for joining us.